Welcome everybody to another episode of Bitcoining. I am your host, Paul Chua, and with me is the dynamic duo themselves in investing real estate, Bitcoin, and crypto. And on this show, our aim is to reveal the Bitcoin strategies, opportunities to leverage your Bitcoin, and what is going on with Bitcoin that not only impacts your financial future, but a lifestyle to be part of. Welcome, Sheen and Chan. Hey, Bong. Good to be here. Bong. Hey, nice to be back and great seeing the three of you again. Um, so what's what's going on what's what's up with bitcoin right now what's up with all that great stuff that people need to know about well today is is uh june the 7th so people have been watching bitcoin go basically sideways for the last uh two or three months and getting bored of watching and that's probably what um you know some of the big players actually want to happen as they are able to keep buying and accumulating well it hasn't moved and uh that's what i mean I don't have any charts in front of me right now to show you, but that's basically what's going on. The big players are buying and accumulating tons and tons of Bitcoin. And the sentiment for most retail investors is, why is it not moving? Why is it not going anywhere? We had a little bit of a bump up um, this week. Now it's like just over $71,000, but still not exciting. And then you look at the metrics of uh, who's Googling crypto, who's watching crypto YouTube channels, who's looking into crypto, um, very slow. Very slow. So the average investor is not thinking about the space at a time when they maybe they should be, because we're at a position right now where it could start to go up. Um, if something bad happens, everything could still go down. Um, but you know we're kind of this uh, uncharted territory where no one knows what the next step is, and so average people say, "I don't want to be involved," and the big money is saying, "I'm going to keep gobbling up as much as I can." So it's, so it's a very interesting point. So what exactly is the reason for for either either mindset? Like if it's not doing anything and there's so much uncertainty, how come the people who's in it goes, okay, let's get more and more and more. Hopefully it kind of stays uh, plateaued for a while. We're just going to keep on accumulating. Yet there's still lots of uncertainty. The other mindset is so much uncertainty, I'm not going to jump in. So why, why the different mindset? I think... Part of it is the media. I mean, when it goes up, that's when you hear about it in the news and that's when people start looking into it. Um, you know, the average person doesn't really care about the technology or what they could do because for a lot of people, Bitcoin isn't that useful to them yet. But if it's a way of making money, then they get very interested. Um, real estate's sort of the same way. You know, as real estate starts going up, more and more people want to buy real estate. If real estate is not doing anything exciting, most people don't care. You know, most people aren't going to speculate and, and throw money into real estate and so, you know, the price doesn't move as much. When it goes up a lot, when it goes down a lot, that's when it gets in the news, that's when people talk. So I think we're seeing a little bit of that right now, but that's actually the boring time is probably the best time to start learning about it and start getting involved and start buying some because um, you want to buy it before it starts going up, obviously. Once it's already gone up, that's typically when a lot of the, we'll call it retail investors come in and they buy at the very top and that's when the big money starts to sell. And then we know what happens next, the crash comes and everyone gets upset and then people, Forget about Bitcoin for four years until it goes back up again. And, uh, you know, hopefully the people watching this can be a little more, more educated and see what's happening and uh, be prepared. So for, for those of uh, us who are sitting there going, okay, fine, you've convinced me. I, I, I need to come, jump in. Do you have any strategies as to, I guess, how to get people to get into it comfortably? So first thing that comes to mind is, okay, um, set a limit of let's say a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, and if you're yeah. you're good with that, put that into X Y Z. Well, if you're not good with ten thousand, maybe five thousand. If not five thousand, a thousand. What's what is your strategy for people who are just brand new and go? Okay, I want to dip my toe into this. How do I start? Chen, any thoughts? The first thing that comes to mind, Fong, is, uh, you know, my own family, my kids. And um, we had this great example, like, um, where their grandmother had given them some cash that she saved on her mattress for many years. And, um, you know, we, the, the traditional way of uh, growing their money is putting it into a savings account and maybe putting it in a bank and letting it grow with interest. And of course, in today's times, that's not going to really work. Um, in in our, my opinion, just because 
things are going to cost more. The inflation is just so much higher. And so we got to start dollar cost averaging into other assets, like real assets that um, have a better store of value than trying to get their dollars saved in a bank account. So when I'm thinking about my kids, it's, it's really like to create discipline. Yes. Saving is good. Um, but the vehicle is, is totally different now. So we, you know, it's harder for the kids to get into real estate. They'd have to, you know, go through all the red tape of, uh, getting the down payment and, um, you know, um, and all that. So I think with Bitcoin specifically, it just levels the playing field, meaning anybody, whether they're in a different country, race, age, it levels the playing field. They could, they could get into that. They could start purchasing that. And when I started teaching my kids about Bitcoin, um, they also needed to learn like the smallest denomination of Bitcoin, which is, we call a Satoshi. So a lot of people didn't know that you could even buy not one Bitcoin, you can buy fractions of a Bitcoin. So that's like mind blowing. Um, so yeah, Bitcoin's, um, you know, there's a hundred million Satoshis in one Bitcoin. So we just started there. Like how much could my kids afford to buy Bitcoin? And they bought fractions and small fractions of a Bitcoin. So uh, we live in Canada. So in Canadian dollars, it could be, you know, $100 a week that we would put their money um, and buy Bitcoin with that and put that into a savings for them. So that that that's what I would suggest if for someone to get started. That is great. Because like, I, I totally agree with the fact that people need to jump into it at some point. And whether it's $100 a week or $1,000 a month or $10,000 every two months or something like that, at least you get started and you get involved with what's going on. And one thing I usually uh, recommend people is that if you want to learn something, if you want to understand what's going on, be involved. Whether it's a small amount or a large amount, once you put a little bit of something in there, you're going to pay a little bit more attention to that something. Whereas if you don't have anything invested, then you don't really care at all. And all of a sudden, three, four years go by and go, oh, my, I, I missed out. So can you take us through the steps? Okay, somebody's sitting there going, okay, I got 100 bucks this week. What do I do? Because is there a minimum? Because the thing is, you have to get things start, started up. You have to set things up. You have to have certain things in place in order for you to actually store and invest and trade and all that kind of stuff with Bitcoin. So I have 100 bucks. Now what do I do? Let me answer that one. <laughs> um, one. <laughs> there, just people know there there are transaction fees involved with moving Bitcoin around. So the place where you buy it first is likely going to be an exchange, and most people will know or have heard of Coinbase. Coinbase is probably one of the more common ones. If you're buying Bitcoin from someone and you want to self, or you want to hold yourself called the self custodian it. Um, you do need a, there's a there's a transaction that has to occur and it's going to cost you some bitcoin to do that transaction so if you're doing very small amounts it becomes expensive so if you're just doing a small amount i would recommend probably looking at an exchange um coinbase is is a us publicly traded company so it's probably not going anywhere and it's well audited so it's probably fairly safe to keep small amounts there if you're looking to do larger amounts i would probably recommend learning about how to hold it yourself custodian it yourself and in that case you need some hardware, a Bitcoin wallet, certain things. That's another advanced level for people to get into. But if you're interested in that, you gotta do some research and learn it. But just to get started, if you're putting like, you know, like you said, hundred bucks a week, um, just doing something like Coinbase or in Canada, Endax is a, is a local exchange here in Calgary, even that, that can do it. Or there's, you probably know a whole bunch more. There's Chan that you can, you can buy in. ShakePay is still around. Um, the risk with those ones is there has been exchanges that that you know go belly up and everyone loses their Bitcoin temporarily. Maybe they get some of it back at some point, but the safest way is to hold it yourself. The second best way is to hold it in an exchange that you are pretty sure is not going to go anywhere. <laughs> and so to, in that order. To hold it yourself basically is to for you to set up your own uh crypto wallet. 
Yeah. So And what, it would be, what would be the two, two levels? So for instance, if somebody has X amount of money to start with, do they jump start with the holding of themselves or the, the trade? It, it comes down to, uh, you know, some people are more worried about losing it than others. But, you know, a good crypto wall is going to cost you a couple hundred dollars. And moving the Bitcoin is going to cost you, you know, five, ten, fifteen dollars. If you buy it on exchange and move it, it costs you a little bit more. They charge a little bit higher fees to move it. So, I mean, the cost of buying it on exchange and moving it might be, let's say, fifty to hundred dollars, and the cost of the wallet might be two or three hundred dollars. So, how much Bitcoin do you need to have before you want to go to that level of security? <clears throat> different for different people. Mm. Is there a rule of thumb? So, if somebody starts <laughs> off with a hundred bucks a week. By the time they get to what stage would you recommend somebody go, okay, I think I have enough here. I need to Yeah. start my own. Ah, well, I mean, the kind of the same question is how much money would you be worried about losing on an exchange for whatever reason? If you're if you're not on one of the major exchanges, you know, if you lost that money, what would happen? And that comes down to the we're treating Bitcoin more of a as a savings mechanism. That's what we're talking about here. If you're looking at it as a you know investment, you probably have to be willing to to risk and lose it all. That's what people normally say. So you're not. Banking on that money being there, not that you're going to lose it in the right places, but you know that's a, that's a risk. One of the nice things about exchanges too is if you do want to start diversifying some of your Bitcoin into crypto, other cryptos like altcoins, then you can do that on the exchange. And every time you transfer it in and out, there's a little bit of a fee, right? So that that is an option for some people, and that's typically the path people go on. And people hear about if they're not into any crypto at all, they hear about people making all this money in these altcoins. They buy Bitcoin. First or USDT, and it immediately goes into these altcoins, and it's basically like a, a small form of gambling for them, right? You're buying these these small cryptocurrency companies that uh, have no track record, may not even have a viable product, and you don't know where it's going to go. But numbers go up, and people <laughs> get excited, and uh, it gives you that adrenaline rush. So basically, it's a uh, you know investment gambling, and if that's People are really risk it. That's that's fine. That's part of the, the ecosystem that happens in the stock market too, right? It's that's part of the world. But what we think to do, we talk right here, is you know, buy Bitcoin as a savings account because you're gonna be holding it long term. We're thinking, you know, five to ten years. At that point, you will see hopefully significant gains in, in the cryptocurrencies. That's what we're doing, that's what we're advising our kids to, you know, put some of their money into Bitcoin too. Um, we've been telling our family and friends, you know, we should buy a little bit. Don't necessarily need to bet the farm. Don't need to put all your retirement money into it, but have a little bit. And I mean, all the big, big players out there, like the BlackRock and Fidelity and the huge, you know, money managers are putting a percent to 5% of their portfolios into it. So if they're doing it, probably a good time for the average person to look at doing it too. Is there, uh, so we're, we're throwing around the number of a hundred dollars a week. Is that minimum? Like if you, if you can't do a hundred dollars a week, can you do 50? Can you do 30? At what stage would you go? Okay. It's not worth doing because of all the fees and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, you come down to the interact charge of a, a dollar or a dollar fifty. <laughs> so that's what's going to cost you to move the money. So if you if you're going to move five dollars at a time, it's going to cost you a dollar fifty. Probably not worth to move that small of an amount. Hmm. But fifty dollars is probably okay. Hundred dollars is probably okay. If you want to do a thousand dollars every couple weeks or once a month or once every three months, that's fine too. But I think it, the reason we do the dollar cost average method is because it's very hard to time the market. And if you look at it, what everybody's saying right now, it's going to go up, it's going to go down. You can hear. pros and cons for both ways. So no one really knows what's going to happen, but over the next you know couple of years, five years, 10 years, where is it going to be then? Most people are pretty confident that it'd be higher than it is right now. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at holding it for the long term, that's that's a safer way to go. And so you don't need to buy it at the all time, you know, the monthly low or the monthly high. If you're trying to wait and find that, you're probably going to just miss out. <laughs> Hey, Shane, maybe you could explain what is dollar cost average. Like, I was just talking to a gentleman, um, you know, maybe he's in his late 60s and he's never even heard of that term, dollar cost average or DCA is what we like to say. What Yeah. What Right, is right. dollar cost average? That's basically that. It's like people think that you want to wait till the, the thing you're going to buy, your investment you're going to buy is at the all time bottom. 
and they're talking about even real estate. Like I'm gonna wait till real estate crashes, uh, buy at the bottom before it goes back up. Well, how do you know when the bottom is, right? And usually at the bottom is when everyone's telling you don't invest. This is the bad time. Everything's going down. The economy's in turmoil. And it's the same thing for for stocks. When Bitcoin drops three percent, all of a sudden doom and gloom's come out and say, yeah, it's going to zero. Don't buy Bitcoin. It's going to drop another twenty percent. And then it goes back up and you missed out on the opportunity. So it's very hard to time those kind of things. So the dollar cost average method means buy a little bit consistently, weekly, bi-weekly, you know, same time every week. So you don't even have to think about what it is. All you know is you're putting a, a little bit in. If it went up, great. If it went down, great. <laughs> Just keep going. And you don't have to put that emotion into the investing. It takes the emotion out of when do I buy? And the same thing works for selling too. Like if it reaches a, a point where you're like, you know what, I would like to take some profits. And whatever investment is, you can dollar cost average out. And that's something you can do with stock and crypto that you can't do as easily with real estate. Mm. How do you dollar cost average out of a house while you sell it? <laughs> it's 100% <laughs> out. So that's, that's uh, it's actually very close to how I got started in uh, the, in silver. I, I made sure that, okay, every, every two weeks I'm buying 10 ounces of silver. I don't care what the market is at. I don't care what the uh, cost is at. I'm going to buy 10 ounces of silver every two weeks. And I did that for three, four years. And then all of a sudden you've accumulated this large amount of silver that now increases in value that you may or may not have anticipated. Now, like when I did it, that it was back when silver was selling for like 20 bucks an ounce. And I think right now we're at 44, $45 an ounce. So yeah, it's, it, it starts off small, but eventually you're going to go, wow, there's so much out there now. One one thing that a lot of people come up to me and go, well, yeah, I don't do crypto because it's not like stocks. I I get stocks. I I, I everybody invests in stocks. It works and all that kind of stuff. Uh, crypto's too too unknown and uh, too volatile. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. If I ask you a few more questions about the stocks that you bought, how much do you actually understand what's going on with those stocks? In the end, they probably don't know. They just go, oh, this manager told me to buy this stock and I bought it. Oh, it's going up, it's going down. You can't really control that. How is that different than you buying some Satoshis or some Bitcoin? You, can, can, you can't control that either. So once you look at it from a different point of view, it's like, it's no different than buying, let's say a Bitcoin stock. Just like people buying gold, when they're buying gold in stocks, it could be paper gold. Yep. So there's no actual <laughs> gold attached to that, yet people are like, okay, no, it's stocks, it's gold, no problem, I'll put my money to that. But once you change that mindset a little bit and go, wait, Bitcoin can be looked at in, in this perspective, it makes a whole lot more sense. Now, um, the thing is when it comes to, okay, so let's go back a little bit. Step number one, for people who have money and wants to invest in Bitcoin, what's the very first step they have to make? <laughs> Just go for the account on Coinbase. Simple. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, you know, if you if, if you have a thing about money, you want to research a little bit more, research different exchanges that you can put your money into. That's probably the easiest way to get some first. Okay. I uh, started with step number one. So is there actually a step number two? <laughs> well, I, I do a little bit different than Sheen's step number one. I don't go to Coinbase. I don't go through the exchange. I would look at more of a peer-to-peer -peer, um, type of... Um, like hodl hodl, um, you know, where it's peer to peer, you, you you have to have set up a wallet, whether it's a hardware um, hard wallet or a soft wallet, something like on your device, like a desktop or a, your phone. And I would go through like a hodl hodl or a, there's a, a company from Swan Bitcoin called uh, when we were talking about DCA, dollar cost averaging, um, you can go into the website called dcabtc.com and um, you can plug in some numbers to see if, hey, if you actually saved like five years ago and bought Bitcoin, what would it be worth now? And and you can have a program that automatically dollar cost averages it for you. Um, so I, I do it a little bit different where I don't go through the exchange just because I to me this is just my opinion not financial advice like i we have a saying in the bitcoin community not your keys not your bitcoin so um for me it's all about control and it's just like real estate like i don't have to acquire that property and go get a mortgage and 
put my name on the title, I would rather have the control of the property, meaning I could rent out the property and I still have that same control where I could sublease it out or do a sandwich lease option, you know, that type of thing. So there's, there's different ways, but it just depends on your risk level and it takes, uh, it does take some education and understanding there is some, some points of security where you want to be knowledgeable enough to know that, Hey, if I do it this way, you're risking that hey, you can lose your Bitcoins. Um, so I would, she and I do things a little bit differently, but our path is the path is to get to accumulating as much Bitcoins as possible. But there's so many different ways to do it. And it just depends on your risk and risk level and education on, on where where to get started. <laughs> so for somebody to jump into your, your strategy, they would have to spend a little bit more time on understanding how to manage it themselves. Well, you both, uh, both strategies, you have to understand on managing it yourself. This is the whole philosophy of Bitcoin is you trying to take away the middle, you know, the centralized points, the middle men of like the banks. Um, but when we're talking about acquiring the Bitcoins, there are like what Sheen said, there's exchanges, there's peer to peer, meaning friend to friend. And there's millions of us around the world that will trade and buy and sell within each other. And that's what I would prefer. Is, is that actually yeah. easier? Like for somebody, let's say if there's somebody out there who goes, oh, I really need to jump into this. Um, and they know a friend that has Bitcoin. Is it easy to, to set up something where, okay, yeah, I'm a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin from- I, I love that. Like kind of do an exchange there we also have a saying it's called orange pill like when you orange pilling someone you've already convinced them that bitcoin you know is the answer so we've orange pilled them and once they're orange pilled and they get it then you literally say okay well here's here's a um you know a, a, a wallet set up the wallet and i'm gonna just transfer you some satoshis that's it. And then once they have that, it feels like, hey, I got some skin in the game. I, I have to, you know, um, make sure that I keep my Bitcoin safe. And so they go into this um, process of learning and learning. And it just takes that little bit. And I think the first move is really just having just a little bit of Satoshis or parts of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And even for, for our kids, it's just like now they have some, they're starting to learn about it. They're starting to learning about it, meaning they're curious about it. They're just asking questions about it. Mm. So um, it's so yeah. funny. I was talking to your wife the uh, yesterday, Jessica, and we were talking to, she had to um, just um, change the baby's diaper. So she was uh, away from the computer and we, I was talking to Kate and she talked, she's like, what's Bitcoin? And, you know, so it's just like, they're naturally curious and that's how it starts. Where, where are the oranges that you peeled already? So, <laughs> <laughs> so for everybody out there, we're one of the, those oranges. Um, <laughs> so when it comes to uh, your strategy of the peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, basically we're doing the, they would have to get their wallets too. And that's what Sheen talked about, getting the, uh, like a couple hundred dollars for that wallet. I think that's the, that's the safest and best way. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we, there's there's a crypto exchanges like Coinbase. There's the ETF, which we haven't really talked about, which you could buy that. But we still feel like at the end of the day, the purpose of Bitcoin was to be able to use it for something, like hold on to it and have security in your own money. Um, there's many ways of having someone else control it. And then they have the security of, of holding on to your Bitcoin for you. Um, it just depends on your risk tolerance. And I agree with Chan. I mean, the best way is to to learn about it and hold it yourself. That's not an the easiest way to get started. So, um, you know, ETF is probably the easiest way for people who already have a, a stock or trading account. Mm -hmm. um, the exchanges is probably the next way because a lot of them are able to, you're, you can like e-transfer money to them and then buy Bitcoin with it. So that's another easy way. The peer-to-peer -peer method is, is great for people that you can trust or maybe small amounts. But I mean, back in the day when we kind of started looking into Bitcoin, we had to, you know, basically send a bank draft to a person we had never met, <laughs> deliver it to them in a parking lot, and then hope that Bitcoin shows up after they deposit in their bank. 
not really the, <laughs> the way you want to do with large amounts of money these days. So everyone's risk tolerance is a little bit different where you want to get started. Um, there's, there's, there's different levels of how easy it is to get started. And the hardest levels are often the, the long-term better methods where you're controlling it yourself. And then, yeah, that's kind of the idea is like, this is a, it's scary for some people because they don't trust themselves. And it's usually because they don't understand the technology enough themselves in terms of, you know, keeping their own Bitcoin and not losing their seed keys and all those little, little steps that, that can go wrong. But I heard this analogy, which is kind of interesting. Someone's like, well, back in the day, people used to dollar cost average if you set into gold and you go down to your local gold exchange, give them some money, they give you a little stack of gold and then you walk through the parking lot with your pocket going, ching, 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 hoping you don't get mugged on the way because it's something physical that someone else could take. Nowadays, you can go do the same thing, but with cryptocurrency and no one could come steal that from you. Mm -hmm. They can threaten you, give me your seed keys, but at the end of the day, if they don't have that, then, you know, they can't take anything from you and you can go anywhere you want with your with your bitcoin seed key in your head and turn it into bitcoin or access your bitcoin anywhere in the world which is something that uh is sort of new to people so there's the the security risk side that yeah i could forget it and lose it all but it's also the, the benefit side of i could take this anywhere without any cost really awesome um one one thing that chan talked about was bringing the getting the kids involved now, when we're talking to adults who have some sort of background in investments or uh, understanding the, of the world of risk and whatnot, how how do you educate kids with regards to, yeah, you could put some money into this, but it might go poof, it's gone. How do you get that concept into their heads to go, okay, there is risk, but some risks are worth taking and some worth, some risks are not worth taking. How do you explain that to them? Yeah, that's a great question, Fong. Um, and it's it's uh, it's interesting because the mechanisms of how to acquire it, like those are the how tos, and those are, you know, that's a process. That's a a different thing. When it, we're talking about kids, and even even like the older folks, like I've been talking to like the grandmas and grandpas, and to me, they're just like my kids. They're just curious, and and really, like one of the questions that came up was like it's not backed by anything. There's nothing behind it. And, you know, I, for me, I, I don't want to convince them that there's something backed by it, but I ask them like, when you pull out your dollar or your $5 from your wallet, what is it backed by? Right. So they start thinking like, well, where, how is money made? Where, who, who creates it? So it becomes an education about the history of how money started and that's where I'd love to have that conversation and the powerful why of why Bitcoin was invented and why money was created and how our countries have debased our currency and it's not backed by anything. And it used to be backed by something like gold. Um, but now we are seeing, maybe she can talk about this, like literally today, like there's countries out there that are, they're backing their, their um their dollars with like oil with gold with bitcoin and even companies now are putting that in their balance sheets um making that more valuable so so yeah back to what how do we teach our kids it's just let's just start from the beginning on how money got started <laughs> and that's a pretty cool conversation and that was a, even a learning process for me because we've been brought up to even not question about where money came from. It was just, just save your money and then invest it and buy real estate and buy stocks. But we just never question like, why do we even have this money system in the first place? And why the people that are closest to the money system are, they have ways to manipulate that. And so Bitcoin to me is my, my kids, your kids freedom of like, no one controls it. There's no authority over it. You know, if they shut the internet off, they shut things down, like it'll still go on. It's it's literally just, you know, a ledger in the cloud with a lot of debits and credits and it'll never be stopped. We just need, you know, the computers, like even two computers going. So it's pretty fascinating and I love I'm learning every day, but it just comes down to learning about money 
And that's something we can talk about more, maybe like in these types of <laughs> episodes. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, now, for people out there who's already have, who's accumulated a bunch of Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, what is the, what's the path forward now? Like we kind of alluded to the, at the very beginning that maybe they should just keep on accumulating since it's still flat. What's the, what's the best way? <laughs> it's always good to keep accumulating. Um, I mean, Michael Saylor is famous in the Bitcoin community and he's always, he's been buying since he got into it in 2019 or, or so, maybe a little bit earlier than that, but um, he buys the top all the time. He doesn't care because his, his idea is that Bitcoin is going to a million dollars. If you buy it at, you know, 60,000 or 70,000 or 15,000 or 2000, doesn't matter when you compare it to how high it could go. There's no real limit to where Bitcoin could go because there's no real limit right now as to how much money can be printed <laughs> in terms of, you know, we're in Canada. So what's the U.S. What's the Canadian government going to going to print if we go into a recession for whatever reason, or what are they going to print if we don't go into recession? Things are pretty good right now, and they're already you know huge deficits. There's huge money printing every year. The U the U S is in this not almost like almost dead spiral where the amount of money they have to print to pay off their debt or their deficit that they're creating every year is growing to the point where they're just going to have to print money no matter what. Their tax revenue does not cover it. So kind of this like it's like like scary point in the world of well, what's going to happen next. And we're at this weird point in the in the stock market where it's still going up, but most of the companies on the S and P, for example, aren't making money. They're all losing money. There's only a little small handful of companies that are that are going up. Everything else is going down. So no one knows where we are in the world. But one thing is for sure is that they're going to keep printing money. <laughs> they're going to keep generating tax revenue. They're going to keep probably raising taxes. But the way things are going, because they keep they can't stop spending. So to protect your money, like Chad's saying, you got to buy an asset. And the difference between the you know the haves and the have-nots is growing bigger every day because asset prices are going up. So if you have assets, you're doing okay. If you don't have assets, it becomes a bigger and bigger struggle until who knows what kind of reset occurs or how they you know switch this. But it's at that point, the people with the money already have most of the assets anyway, so they don't care what money system you use as long as they have the assets to benefit from it with. So Bitcoin is sort of that, like Chad said, that way to level the playing field a little bit. It's the only asset class that's ever been created that you can't create more of. It's it's hard-coded, it's set in stone. There's only gonna be so much in the world. And so owning a piece of it is probably a good idea because if it does, <laughs> if money, the money supply can go infinite, then you know, Bitcoin can be tied to that. The value of Bitcoin will keep going up with it. So that's sort of the reason why we, Convince people to, you know, at least look into Bitcoin, learn a little bit about it and get involved and hold on to as much as you can for as long as you can. Awesome. Great. Now, before we wrap up this episode, any final words or thoughts that, that either one of you want to share? You go first, Jen. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I, I think when I think about Bitcoin and our family, just teaching them the why why do we want to do this? And really for that, that security, that future, that they're not left behind. Um, Bitcoin, essentially, it's just software. So if you're talking about something, it's backed by something, it's your, you're investing in that software that cannot be controlled or deleted or changed or made more of. Um, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. And it's, I wanted to keep saying the best invention in our history right now. So um, just learning about it is pretty cool. I think university should have just something dedicated to learning about Bitcoin for our kids even. Yeah. Cool. Oh, <laughs> That's good. I mean, hopefully we've convinced some people that don't know anything about Bitcoin to at least look into it a little bit. And for those who have Bitcoin, I mean, yeah, you keep doing what you're doing, I guess. And, Everyone in the Bitcoin community is sort of waiting to see what happens over the next uh, year, I guess, is, is most people's timeline. So the halving happened in April. And uh, like every halving, not a lot of excitement happens right after. It takes a few months for things to really kick off. And so with our political landscape and our economic landscape that we're all kind of in right now, lots of uncertainty. But one thing is certain over the long run, you know, we think Bitcoin is, is going to be a, a real winner. So... The future is bright long term. I want to leave the rest with that. 
even though the short term might be a little scary long term i think you know we're on the right path awesome stuff so everybody make sure uh just get involved uh get involved with it no matter if it's small amounts large amounts just get involved so that you could at least be more cognizant as to what's going on in the Bitcoin world and the crypto world. And if there's any questions, I'm sure Sheen and Chan would answer them or uh, connect with them. Who knows? They may be the people that you do peer to peer with. So um, make sure you connect with Sheen and Chan. And yeah, for 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 the next episode, I think we have some pretty cool things coming up. Uh, I'm very excited for our next show. And until next time, uh, when you are Bitcoining, you are shaping tomorrow's economy. We'll see you later.